Harry Beck, the man who invented London Underground's famous map, was an unemployed engineering draftsman who worked obsessively on his ideas in his spare time. I'm obsessed with his map too. I think it is the greatest British design icon of all time. And do you know how much he was paid for his pains? The princely sum of five guineas. Oh, and he's now got a plaque at Finchley Central Station. To this day, Harry Beck's map is the template for underground maps throughout the world. And you can see it everywhere. It's on boxer shorts and braces. It's all over the place. It's one of Transport for London's biggest assets. So sit back and enjoy the story of a quintessential Englishman and his groundbreaking map in Design Classics. The London Transport Underground map, the work of an obscure draftsman, is one of British graphic design's greatest triumphs. It's a 20th century classic. They keep a copy in New York's Museum of Modern Art. It has distinguished admirers all over the world. The map, of course, is uh, extraordinarily lucid uh, in its uh, execution and also in its conceptualization. And so we like it. I mean, we, we say, that's a nice object. But more than that, we say, I can find out where I want to go easily through it. It's almost impossible to improve. And it's beautiful to look at. So what else can I name to give it the image of a perfect piece of design? The map is an attempt, through design, to impose sense on a huge and complex system. 250 miles of track. Two hundred and seventy-three stations. The map is there to guide the two and a half million people who use the underground every day. I remember when I first came to London, it was 1950, and um, it, it was terribly confusing. And then I went down in the underground, and I saw this marvellous clear diagram, and I thought uh, somebody had me in mind. Somebody thought about the problems of newcomers to London and how to sort yourself out. Uh, I think it was the most splendid revelation for all of us who found themselves in London for the first time and wanted something to help them get, the, get around. From its earliest days, attempts were made to map the London Underground. No easy task. It was made up of many companies operating many different lines. The man with the job of bringing it all together, buses as well, was the first chief executive of the London Transport Passenger Board which was founded in 1933. Frank Pick had worked for the London Underground most of his life. He had a passion for modern design, and he set out to revolutionise London transport through design. Design could impose an appearance of unity. He had the logo redesigned, and it became the heart of a highly successful new corporate identity. It was the work of Edward Johnston, as early as 1915, Pick had employed Johnston to design a new, simplified typeface. The sans serif he produced exemplified the virtues of modern design. It was clean-lined, logical and efficient, qualities Pick wanted to see imposed on the system as a whole. Pick was very concerned to present the underground system as rational, scientific and efficient in its management. And one of the ways in which he tried to do that was through the architecture of the underground stations. He chose uh, Charles Holden um, 
to design the new extension stations on particularly the Piccadilly and Central lines. And Holden's approach was to use a kind of architecture which would be understood as rational and modern, in other words, uh, a kind of European modernism. Uh, he realised, or was instructed, that the stations must all be recognisable as belonging to the same species, so that if one saw an underground station, it should be recognisable as part of the underground system. In the same year that Holden's new stations were opened, 1933, came another breakthrough. The London Passenger Transport Board introduced a new, revolutionary underground map. Like the new stations, it was uncluttered and functional. It was there to convey information efficiently. Form followed function. Histories tended to credit Frank Pick with another heroic design milestone. Yet, in fact, it wasn't Pick's idea at all. A new map hadn't even been commissioned. It had been presented out of the blue, and the board's first reaction was to turn it down, as being altogether too strange and revolutionary. The map was produced not by a graphic designer, but by an unknown 29-year-old engineering draftsman working for London Transport. He was called Harry Beck. Beck designed it in his own time, in fact, while he was laid off as part of an economy drive. Beck made his first rough sketch, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, in 1931 in a school exercise book. From this, he produced the first version, all hand-drawn with immense labour. It was turned down. Harry Beck died in 1974, but towards the end of his life he told what happened to graphic designer Ken Garland. It's too revolutionary. Those are their very words. You know, it wouldn't mean anything to anybody. Um, they would, just wouldn't understand it. So he took it away again. And uh, his friend said, oh, you're crazy, you know, it's so good, you, you must get it to them again. So he went and showed it to them again, and they said, oh, all right, we'll give it a go. And they printed a trial edition of about 500 copies. Um, just, I think, to say, well, we don't think it's much cop, but we'll give it a tryout. And this was in 1932, 33, turn of the year. And they issued 500 copies in a central station of the underground. People lapped it up. They absolutely... Uh, devoured it and a second edition was immediately ordered and then a third and then the thing from there on it was a winner earlier maps of the system had been literal representations of distance there had been many versions and updates to accommodate the expanding system which had become bewilderingly complicated and difficult to follow This one, by F.H. Stingemore, was the most modern. It dates from the mid-twenties. Colour coding had been introduced, and the details of the city had been dropped, leaving only the lines and the stations in relative clarity. But these still stuck rigidly in layout and scale to true geography. Beck's map certainly did not. He realised that it wasn't necessary to show on this diagram the... Uh, relative distance between stations. What was important was to see what station came after what station and where they connected with one another. So uh, that was the, the key thing that um, was in the back of his mind. It seems such a common sense idea now, but I think at the time uh, people were really startled. Um, they kept saying to him, well, why have you ignored geography? Uh, it, to him, it seemed common sense. If you're going underground, why do you need to bother about geography? It's not so important. Connections are the thing. Beck totally threw off all geographical shackles. He deliberately enlarged and distorted the central area, the most heavily used and complex part of the system, to make its lines and its many connections clear. What Beck had produced was not in fact a map at all, but a diagram. His stylized rendering of the system was a breakthrough in itself. Had he still felt it necessary to show some degree of actual distance, his map would have looked like this. In order to keep the map to manageable proportions, the outer sections had to contract. 
Scale and geography are thrown to the winds, but now the whole system can be seen at a glance, and the central area is so much clearer. Where had Beck's ideas come from? All around him, for inspiration, were the fruits of Frank Pick's enlightened modernist patronage. And not only in architecture. Pick had continued London Transport's patronage of graphic artists like the American McKnight Kaufer. Pick was thus putting before a general public for the first time posters in the style of the Cubists and the Vorticists, masters of the modern movement. They carried the message that art no longer had literally to present what it portrayed, and critics have even detected the influence of artists like Mondrian on the map. But Mr Beck from High Barnet, at the end of the Northern Line, seems to have been unmoved by such things. He worked purely on the basis of uh, a system of trial and error. He just thought, well, let's have a go at that and let's have a go at this. He had in his mind electrical circuit diagrams. Don't forget, he was an engineering draftsman. And, and uh, if you look at the diagram, you can see, I think, its relationship to the sorts of diagrams which electrical and mechanical engineers um, uh, work with all the time. And that was the origin, I think, of his imagery. Electrical circuitry, showing clearly lines and points of connections, the inspiration of the London Underground map. That this is true is illustrated by Beck himself. He drew this cartoon, his own map, shown as a wireless diagram. The stations and interchanges as puns on electrical terminology. Beck, although he was across a professional draftsman, was not a, a graphic designer. And I think it was very valuable to him to have continually a feeling that he was a member of the public who was bending his, his skill as a draftsman to making sense out of a very difficult to understand system. And I think it was that innocence which helped the diagram to be as clear as it was. Now as much a symbol of London as any tourist spot, the map was designed without reference to design dogma or aesthetics. Yet it satisfies aesthetically too, without apparently even trying. You know you have the most, um, frequently, have the most serious intentions uh, intellectually, and then you do something and it turns out to look absolutely dreadful. Um, and all design basically is a strange combination of the intelligence and the intuition where the intelligence only takes you so far and, and uh, then uh, your intuition has to sort of reconcile some of the logic in some peculiar way. Uh, working with the conscious mind alone does not necessarily produce what we call beautiful results. I mean, there is a totally other dimension that's much more difficult to grasp although it's very attractive to talk about the conscious part because, in fact, that's the only thing you can talk about. Frank Pick's verdict on the map was grudging. I must confess it's very convenient and tidy and a better map than any we've had so far. London Transport paid Beck a mere five guineas for his original design, although he did get his name engraved modestly at the edge. It was a big hit, however, with the public, pouring in for work or leisure to the city and West End. However far people lived from the centre, they could still feel like sophisticated Londoners exploiting the pleasures of the capital. During the 1920s and 30s, London Transport was, or the underground electric railways, were extending the lines out into the outer suburbs. And relatively speaking, the outer suburban lines uh, were underutilised, except at peak times. The problem was to get traffic on those outer lines outside the peak hours. There was a whole programme of, of advertising with posters encouraging people to 
take walks in the countryside and go out at weekends and visit uh, historic sites and so on. But the point about the map was that it made those outlying stations at the ends of the line seem relatively cl close to the centre of London. The prospect of making a journey to Cockfosters or Ryslip, uh, if one had looked at a geographically correct map, would have seemed rather formidable. Looking at the underground map, it looks reasonably simple. After the first breakthrough, the map went through a period of slow evolution. For 26 years, Beck strove to perfect his original design. And as the underground expanded, it needed updates and revisions. Version followed version. As new ideas were introduced, some were adopted, others abandoned. Only the stylized River Thames remained as the one essential geographical feature. Beck was much preoccupied by the problem of how to depict interchanges. Circles, diamonds and linking rings were all tried. The stations, indicated by blobs on the original design, were replaced by a simple graphic device called a tick, which greatly increased clarity. For Beck, the task became an obsession. The work on this uh, map, this diagram, was all done in his spare time. Uh, and they would throw ideas at him which had to be elucidated over the weekend, and he had to come up with some um, solution so quickly that he was afraid to go away in case something should happen. <laughs> when he did go away, uh, wherever he went, the uh, little sketches would go with him. There'd be pencil sketches strewn everywhere. His, uh, his wife told me that uh, she was forever finding them under the bedclothes and uh, uh, in uh, bits uh, just stuck away in corners. Um, so I, I don't think he ever was free of it. It was a total obsession to him. It was a child that grew up um, under his hand. The 1949 version of the map was considered by Beck to be his masterpiece. There's a strong emphasis on vertical lines. The colour coding has finally been settled and the familiar yellow rectangle of the circle line has emerged. A new solution to the problem of depicting interchanges was introduced, linking white bars. But geographical accuracy has been even further abandoned. By straightening out the northern line, its southern end seems miles away from the district line, pulling Wimbledon on the left and South Wimbledon far apart. In fact, there's only half a mile between them. Well, I think for many people, the, the map now is the best representation of London that they have. That is, people perceive London through the underground map and actually have little idea as to where... Uh, Cockfosters or South Morden actually stand in their true geographical positions. They know London through the underground map rather than anything else. Anyone wanting to travel between, say, Queensway and Bayswater will find the map the epitome of clarity. You take the central line west to Notting Hill Gate, change to the district or circle line, go one stop north to Bayswater. It couldn't be simpler. The reality is somewhat different. Getting down to the platforms, changing trains, and actually travelling will take almost 10 minutes, with no waits for trains. Yet the stations are only a few hundred yards apart. Journey time on foot, about one minute. It was the f one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first step towards... Uh, map making where the, the maker did lie about the topographical situations of actual stations and it was this breakthrough which was so revolutionary and he created a very clear graphic system and it's this clarity which deals with uh, visual communication and that's sometimes very difficult for quite a lot of designers to come up with a very clear and simple and functional piece of graphic communication because graphic communication deals with communication via the eye.
Harry Beck's versions of the map were in use until 1960. But then, after 26 years' dedication to his map, he was pushed aside. Harold Hutchison, head of publicity at London Transport, thought he'd like to have a go at a replacement. But the elements which had by this time made the London map so popular, particularly its clarity, were sacrificed. Hutchison's map was an ugly, spiky design with sharp angles. It was not a success. Passengers were confused. Hutchison's map was scrapped. There was yet another design. It went back to Beck. It restored the map's reputation, and the updated version is the one in use today. Again, no one actually asked for a replacement, and again, it was not the work of a graphic designer, but of London Transport's Assistant Secretary and Works Officer. Christmas, I think Christmas 1963, I thought, I've run out of crossword puzzles, so I'll try and redesign the map. And that I did in a couple of days at home on a piece of squared paper. The problems were, were largely sort of geometrical problems. You find that uh, you get one corner of the thing right, uh, but you cannot get the next corner right. And you have to make a compromise in some way or other between uh, one side and the other side of the map. And even as a thing like bringing in the Jubilee line means a very considerable recast of the whole map. If you touch it in one place, you know you've got to touch it all over, more or less. I tried to get as many continuous straight lines in it as I reasonably could. For example, the northern line and the central line through the central area are absolute straight lines. And I tried in every way to make it easily comprehensible to the passenger. And also, it looked nice. London's underground map has, so far, always been able to adapt to change, to respond to the growth of the system. Like the last change, the extension of the Piccadilly line to Heathrow's Terminal 4. And there are further huge schemes ahead. The Docklands Light Railway, seven and a half miles of track and 16 new stations, with names like Mud Chute and Canary Wharf, is due to open next month. The new addition to the map has been neatly accommodated, tucked into the empty southeast corner of the diagram. The light railway will link this, the largest redevelopment area in Europe, to the main underground system at Bank. With more and more people expected to use the system, there are other ambitious plans, each of which will again alter and put pressure on the map. The influence of the underground map on the maps of other transportation systems has been profound. There are now about 80 underground systems throughout the world, and virtually every one uses a diagrammatic map, copied or adapted from the London model. The use of diagonals, colour coding, clear interchanges and lettering are all now standard practice. It's used by road, rail and air networks too. London Transport has recently tried to revive the old commitment to design. A badly needed facelift is underway. But in the heady atmosphere of change and refurbishment, the plan is to leave the map more or less as it is. Perhaps it's time for London Transport to make amends for their lack of generosity to Harry Beck and acknowledge again his role in the design of one of the century's most famous images. Beck's name has disappeared from the map and uh, he has really made this absolutely magnificent piece of graphic design and I think Mr. Beck not only deserves his name on it, he deserves a commemorative stamp for it. <laughs> it's uh, an almost eternal piece of mapping. <laughs> 